Here's version 0.9. So the flagship things in this new update are scope, ease of use, and audio processing. Um, the project's gotten really big at this point, so that it's more objects than we've ever had before, and I've had to completely restructure how things work. One of the things that I want to do in this update is to give a quick overview for those people that are new to SP Tools of what the project can do, what you can do with the package, and what the kind of general lay of the land is. So for the most part, um, the core things are low latency audio analysis, descriptor analysis, and some machine learning. So I'll give a proper tour of this overview patch in a minute, but with onset detection, we have a few different flavors of that. That's one of the core things in SP tools, being able to detect when something has happened and then do something as a result of that. Beyond that, we can do a lot of audio analysis, both in terms of onset based audio analysis or real time continuous audio analysis. So this, you can do this for pitch, loudness, descriptors, MFCCs, Mel bands, sinusoids. There's a whole bunch of different types of audio descriptors you can analyze and all of them can be done on an onset based thing or continuous or a couple different versions, but those are the main flavors of it. Beyond that, there's some machine learning stuff in here where you can do things with um, classification and clustering. So training a model and then have it recall when like I've done a sound like that and have it do something accordingly. There's some also some stuff in here with regression as well for those of you that are doing machine learning stuff already. There's quite a lot in terms of sample playback. So based on some of this audio analysis or onset detection, you can then choose to play samples in a variety of ways using audio analysis or just onset detection itself. And there's also uh, concatenation and resynthesis. So a few different approaches to how to resynthesize sounds with all this on audio analysis. Also, there's quite a few communities on here already. So there's a Flucoma forum where you can come on here and there's quite a bit of discussion. There's some discussion on the uh, lines forum for the SP tools. There's the um, actual Flucoma page itself. And there's also a Discord server with quite a few people on it here asking questions and getting involved. So if that's something you're interested, in, there's a few community places online that you can get involved with. So the big flagship features in this one are scope, ease of use, and audio processing. So the scope part is when I first started SP Tools, it was mainly me trying to do some of the functionality that you can get from sensor percussion software. But in Max, I wanted to be able to play with it and pull apart the algorithms and map things in a much more open way that you can in the sensor percussion software. Over a bunch of updates, it's changed quite a bit where I've started adding new features, things that aren't in sensor percussion and moved beyond that. And then seeing a lot of other people using SP tools, not for drums. So one of the main things in this update, both in terms of the patches and the examples, is that the scope of the project has changed to no longer be drum percussion focused. Everything's still super low latency and I myself use it more often in that context, but I've made things with the assumption, no longer having the assumption that what the input is, is a drum. So uh, a lot of things have changed in that regard and I'll show examples of that throughout. The ease of use thing is um, one to make it just easier for onboarding, but there's a lot of common tasks that you might do, which required a bunch of objects to put them together. There's a ton of plumbing that I've put in place to make those things that are really common to do much more streamlined. So either a higher order abstractions or just changing how things work in general, just to make it easier to do the things that you would want to do. And finally, there's a slew of audio processing things, which I'll show later on, but largely to do with decomposing and deconstructing audio in different ways. So a bit of housekeeping here. So we're almost at 1.0. So this is version 0.9 and the updates have gotten bigger and bigger in terms of the scale of objects I added. My goal is for the 1.0 to pitch it to Cycling74 and have them put it on the package manager. But because of the scope of the project changing, um, I'm gonna change the name. So when it comes to 1.0, it's gonna be a different name, which is gonna break all your patches, but the, it'll still be a two letter prefix and then the object. So all the object names will stay the same. Just the, it won't be called SP Tools anymore. It'll be something else. And I'm doing that for a few reasons. One of them is just the, the scope of it changing and also disambiguating for it from sensory percussion full stop. So it's just its own thing because it doesn't really 
Some of the stuff is overlapping now with classification, but for the most part, it, it's a whole different set of tools. So I want to change that. Things are also structured a little bit differently now. So I'm going to give you a tour of this overview patch. But in addition to that, the way that the GitHub is going to be organized is going to be a little different as well, just to make things a little bit more separate in terms of the components you want, whether you want the max package or you want some pure data or you're just using max for live or now there's additional Copora on there that you can download. All of that is structured different. So it's not just one big monolithic file you have to download. And then there's bits in there that may not be relevant to you. So the first thing I want to give a tour of is this overview patch. So as you can see, it's quite a bit different from before. I've taken quite a bit of inspiration from the Flucoma overview patch but I've adapted it to the things that are important, SP tools. Um, so on this first page here, we have the tutorial videos, which are the launch videos for each of the, both the teaser videos and then each individual update and what it covered. And if you click on one of these, it'll take you to that video. Next, because there's so many objects now, it's no longer possible to list all of the objects in one place, or rather it wouldn't really make sense. So now there's all these categories. So depending on what you wanna do, you know, look at onset detection, there's a bit of a blurb, and you can see the things, click it, and it'll open up the help file for that specific object. And this is the case for all of the objects. So you can browse around here and just find the kind of thing that you wanna do much more quickly. Or you can come here to use cases. So there's a certain kind of thing you wanna do with sample playback, or you have a specific bit of gear, be it sensor percussion, or the array touch, or bot pad, or modular. Um, you can browse by a category and then see objects that might be of interest or related to what you're doing, or you're a performer and instrumentalist and these type of tasks are interesting to you. So this is a way where you can browse by the category of object. And here you can browse by the category of thing that you're wanting to do. So it's just an easier way to get at the stuff that you want to get at. In addition, there's an inspiration tab now, which links to a bunch of use cases of SP tools, both myself and other people. And this is something I want to populate over time. And then I've also included in here some of the uh, videos and articles from the Flucoma thing. So that's under this what SP Tools is powered with, but it's useful here. Eventually, when I have enough uh, SP Tools specific media, I might change this out so it's just SP Tool ones in here, but I wanted to round it out with that. And then finally, throughout SP Tools, all the help files, there has been there's dozens upon dozens of interesting musical quips, which you'd have to typically either go hunting around for. So what I've done here, this is I think 20 of them of kind of greatest hits from the help files and they've been made a bit more generic. So if you want to click on one, it shows you um, the patch. There's a few different audio examples that might work well with it and you can put it away. So this is another way that you can browse some of the different functionality that you can do with SP tools. So the GitHub repository is gonna be structured a bit differently as well. So I've not pushed this update to GitHub yet, so I'll sh but I'll just show you what the structure is gonna be here on my computer. So um, the max package is here and it's what you would put in your max package folder as you would before. The only difference now is the GitHub is going to be one level above that. So there's a separate one for all the max for live devices because if you're not interested in that, there's no need to download that. So all of those have been updated to the new, all the new patches. There's a separate folder now for all the pure data things. Again, if you're not into Max and just using pure data, you have all of those there now. Um, the Quick Start and Readme are now at that level. And now there's a separate folder here for additional corpora. So these are ones that are, it's a bit too big to include all of them in it, but if you want, there's some additional ones that you can see here. And these have been structured differently as well to make it easier to add and remove them. So that's the structure of the GitHub repository now. Now, in terms of the max package folder itself, if you come in here, you've got, well, there's a few different folders because there's quite a lot more added. The examples are in here, but you can browse them through the overview patch. But coming here to the media folder, here's where things get a little different. This has now been organized. So there's some impulse responses in here, but there's a corpora folder. So before the samples were in one place and all the uh, corpora, the corpus analysis files were somewhere else, now they're all self-contained. So if you've got your accordion one, here it's got the media and its analysis file with it. The plum butter stuff, here's the analysis file with all the media with it. So if you go and you download from the GitHub repository, some additional corpora, you can just take that whole folder and put it inside your max package folder. If you want, you, you could put it wherever you want, but you it's now structured so you can easily put it in the corpora folder and just go on about your business. Another thing that's new here to make things a little bit easier to get around uh, common tasks as part of the ease of use thing, there's now snippets. So if you come to snippets and you'll see this SP tool snippets thing on here. 
So on here are a bunch of the common tasks that you might do. So I just want some quick onset detection. There's your input, your output, a bunch of the UI objects you might need with it. Okay, I want to do something a bit more complex. So I'm doing some corpus sampler stuff. I can drag this over here and I've got all the components that I need. So this is just another way to make the common tasks that you will be often doing, make that a little bit easier. So I don't have to go fishing through help files. You can just come in here, drag the bits you need and you're ready to go. Okay, and on to breaking changes. So there's a few breaking changes in this one and they mainly have to do with the, the naming space. So some objects that had similar names to other things or functions that had similar names to other things have all been consolidated, but it may very well break your patches. Just to, I'll quickly list through them now. So everything that had train in the name, so class train and setup train are now called uh, class create, setup create, um, and also cluster create. So all of those, everything is now create. So corpus create, class create, just to unify all of those namespaces. Um, the onset stuff has now been tweaked where because of the scope of the project, I spent quite a bit of time refining the onset detection algorithms. Um, so the macro controls of sensitivity lockout, well, sensitivity mainly has now been tweaked to make it a little bit more general across a wide range of material. So the way that these thresholds move there at the bottom, so if I play some audio back here, so the way that these thresholds now move, it, it's just a bit more general across a wider range of material. Um, it should just, in general, work better for everything that you're doing. But if you have gone in the past and you've specifically fine-tuned your sensitivity for a specific performance or patch, it's going to be different now. So I wanted just to mention that, that it should uh, it potentially break a patch if you have that. Some other stuff that was changed was the overlapping names of a lot of parameters because there's a lot of higher order abstractions now, things that shared a name like threshold and floor. Uh, when you put the abstractions together, it doesn't make any sense. So I went through and combed through all the parameters. So some stuff has been named, renamed differently. So threshold is now named floor. Um, there's a lot of stuff with um, threshold is now called sensitivity for some of the objects. So sensitivity is now a macro parameter that's in all the onset detection stuff. The input modes are now quite different as well. Again, back to the scope of the project, it no longer presumes that you're plugging in a drum with a sensor percussion hardware. So now there's five, well, six, counting from zero, different input modes that accommodate a lot of different inputs. So the default now presumes that you're coming in with just audio, just regular microphone audio. Uh, input one is what used to be the main one, so it presumes sensory percussion. Then we have three, four, five, and six. A couple new things which I'll unpack later on, but now there's some microphone correction because there's convolution involved in the project now. But all of these are different. So if you've used any input modes, these this well, you'll have to change and adapt to the new one. If you used uh, it before with sensor percussion hardware, you just make the default input one, and that's good to go. Now, if you did do the, uh, like I often do, where I have a sensory percussion sensor and another air mic, that's input three as it was before. So that's another thing that's slightly changed. Another small breaking change here is that the way that clusters work is now they count from one instead of zero. So cluster, the first cluster is now cluster one, and the second cluster is two, and the third cluster is three, and they're now uh, integers instead of symbols where they were before. And this is for reasons that this is a way that we can communicate across a lot of patches now, where you have things either going from zero to one in a float, or one, two, three, four, five to whatever. Um, it just makes things more interoperable. So that's another thing that's changed with clusters. And the final breaking change is with classifier display. It no longer has a sensor percussion snare and a sensor percussion kick as the default modes. What it does now, it will inherit whatever classes you've created when you created the class. So if you do want to have it show up as a sensor percussion thing, there's now different attributes for naming them as such. So you can still have the same display and it'll do that. But by now, just to make it more easier across or more useful across a wider range of inputs, whatever you trained your class names as, when you load it, it will automatically populate the classifier display with it. Okay, and now for a tour of the new stuff. So one of the new flagship things, or one of the new flagship objects in here is SP Sampler. So it's funny, in the first, the very first update, or this even up to the second update, one of the things I didn't want to do was make a sampler, just because they're so fussy and everybody wants different things, but over the course of all the updates, it needs to be there. So I've made, I think, a pretty, full featured sampler that works across all of the use cases that you have in SP tools. And it is a UI object and it looks quite tight and organized. So I spent quite a bit of time tweaking this. So this is SP sampler. <laughs> So 
So SP Sampler is the all-in-one sample playback object that you can use basically for all the sample playback that you have in SP Tools. It will work with the corpus-based stuff. It'll work with individual sample stuff. You can load samples, folders of samples, and it'll handle all of them well. So the different ways that you can load stuff is I can drag individual samples in. So I have a sample here. Let me get a folder of samples here. Let's get some media. Um, let's take some of these chunky base samples and I can literally just drag them onto the window. And if I open up here, I can see all those samples are now loaded. Um, when you have samples loaded in here, you can trigger them in a bunch of different ways. So you can trigger them by sending an audio trigger like you would have with any onset detection. It's kind of weird here because I loaded a bunch of samples. Or you can send the integer, so which here I have mapped to the keyboard. So you can trigger samples in a couple different ways. Because of how classification and clustering has been restructured, you can now connect the output of classification directly to sampler and it'll play back samples based on the matched class. Then I added a bunch of stuff where you can play, depending on the message type that you send it, you can give it a list of one, two, or three items and it'll do transposed versions of it or adjust the velocity of it. Or if I connect the output directly from one of the descriptor objects, so the descriptor analysis or controllers, it'll take the loudness of that and play, um, apply that to the sample in addition to selecting a random sample based on it. So you can connect just about every object to Sampler and it'll interact with it in some way. The Sampler features are pretty much identical to Corpus Player, which is essentially this is a UI wrapper around Corpus Player. It does add some new things to it, but the core things of being able to select what part of the sample you play, whether it's a fade in or fade out, or you apply a curve, all that stuff is um, just made a little bit more streamlined. And as you can see now, there's UI visualization for that. So depending on what part of the sample you have selected, you can now see what's being done. And then you have controls over speed, time stretch, how many voices, whether it's voice stealing and gain, similar to what you had before. So in terms of loading samples, as I showed before, you can just drag a folder of samples or you can drag individual samples. When you have more than one sample in there, when you open this side thing, you can reorder things in here. So let's say I want sample one to be a specific sample. I can just put that sample to be a sample one and they'll reorder. Um, so this just makes it easier if you have specific classes. So let's say you trained a kick, snare, hat or whatever, and you're using those as classes and you want, uh, let's say a kick, snare and hat sample to be the ones that play back. If you dragged it and they weren't in that order, you can come in here and drag them and rearrange them. Additionally, you can just read individual files. So if there's a file that I want, I can just click it and now it's in the list there. So that's in there. So just put a sample from this list or tell it to stop. Or additionally, you can do load or load folder, depending on if you want to load, let's say a folder of samples. So it's much easier to get a lot of samples in here and in different orders that you want. For Corpus playback, you can literally just connect the output of Corpus match right to SP sampler. And it'll work just as it would for Corpus player. So depending on the kind of patch that you're making, if you want a UI, you can use this object, or if you're not interested in the UI, you can just use Corpus Player, and they're functionally the same. Corpus Match also has the compensation stuff built in from Corpus Player, so you can load samples and use the loudness and spectral compensation as you would have before. Something that's new in Corpus Player, but has also been populated over to um, SP Sampler, is the fact that you can jump around a sample. So now you can send a jump message appended uh, or appended with a value and it'll jump to that sample, the most recently played sample in that position. So it lets you do stuff like this where you're doing a, I guess, MLR style uh, sample stuff shot. And in this case, I'm also quantizing, which is a new object that I'll explain later on. And here's a musical example where I'm using the brushes musical example to trigger a cascade of uh, detuned toy pianos, uh, droney time stretched uh, electric guitar, some drums, and as well as some vocal samples that it's doing a kind of scratching, like record scratching type playback. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, and that's SP Sampler. As part of the ease of use stuff, one of the things that I want to do is to take common tasks that you would do and just make them quite a bit easier. So one thing I found myself often doing is I would be doing classification, but then I also want a descriptor stuff. So I always have to put all the patches and make sure that everything's connected in the right order to get the class message and the descriptor output kind of in concert. So what I did is I built, we look here, there's a whole slew of class blank objects. So classifier or or is it uh, class controllers, class descriptors, class mail bands, class MFCCs, class signs. So all of these are similar to the ones without class. So for example, class descriptors, the main difference is that what comes out of it is a class name followed by the descriptors that you wanted. So what it lets you do is just have one object and get a class as you normally would with any classification stuff, but then also get the descriptors. And this is the case for all of the common descriptor types. So including the signs, mail bands, MFCCs, um, descriptors, and then a new one, kitchen sink, which I'll explain in a second. So I'll go to the class here. So I've got my mail bands here and I've got my classes. So with each one of these objects, you have quite a lot of different outputs that you get from it. So you get, you get the class, you get the descriptors, both as a list or a buffer, depending on the object that you're using. You get a trigger and a gate as you normally would. And then you also have this dump outlet, which tells you the amount of classes that you have, what the class names are, how many hits of each class that are the class indices and the class means. If you do a print, you can also see how many classes are per, uh, how many instances of each class there are. So it, it's a useful thing to, to get more information out of that. The inputs, this patch is similar to across a lot of the places. And like I explained before, you have different input modes now, whether you're using center percussion hardware or you want to do some mic correction, all this stuff works just well with everything else. So with the class objects, you have all these combined versions of everything. So we have class mail bands and it's like classification with your mail bands all coming from one place. So that's just an effort to make it easier to take these tasks that you wanted them to happen, but now they happen and they're time aligned and everything comes out in the order that it should. Now the thing that I want to do is to take Again, for to make things easier to use, I often find myself wanting to have the um, compensation when I'm doing corpus playback. And when you need to do that, you needed to have your audio descriptors and you need to have your mail bands and you need to analyze them in a certain order. So now there's a corpus analysis object, which does all that for you. So if I take corpus analysis and plug it into corpus match, I have access to all the compensation stuff as I would before, but it's now just a single object version of that. So within that, I can now, if I wanted to, in Corpus Player, do the different compensation modes of loudness and spectral stuff because the output of Corpus Analysis is providing the type of descriptors that are needed in order for that to happen. Similarly, if you wanted to do the Corpus Sampler stuff and aren't interested in intervening in the, the various steps of the process, now there's a single object just called Corpus Sampler. So you can load up Corpus Sampler, tell it the corpus you want to load, and you're ready to go. <laughs> On top of that, you can define it as an argument. So let's say I want Corpus a piano and that's automatically done and furthermore if I want to have a setup as well I could tell setup in this case um, this is voice actually vocals and now it takes the corpus match <laughs> and it applies the setup for this particular thing so it just makes it easier to do so you don't even need that if you wanted to do a corpus sampler so an area that got massively improved in this one which isn't something that I set out to do but I was improving things and I just really cracked it in terms of uh, both the result and just the general quality of it was the way that concatenation works in SP tools. So initially I added concatenative synthesis because I wanted to have it as a feature for the real time. I had the real time descriptors and I was like, oh, this was a cool use case of it, but I didn't really have, uh, it didn't really sound great. It sounded fine, but it was, it was sounded good enough to include. But along the way, I've improved that quite a bit. So the code has changed so many places across this, so I can't exactly show you the before and after, but um, I did record an audio file when I was first made the change. So have a have a listen to the difference. The old shit. The new shit.
So that's comparing what concatenative synthesis sounded like in version 0.8 and version 0.9. And it's actually improved a little bit from when I recorded this example. So I'll give you a quick tour of some of the things that have changed there. So as you heard in that example, just the general quality of the concatenation is worlds better. So it matches the descriptors better and it just sounds less clunky overall. I've slightly changed some of the playback settings, which I'll show in a second, but the, comp the compensation is where a big change happened. So what I used to do in an old patch that I had um, called CC Combine, um, which I then made a Max for Live device on and did a few talks on, I used to take the, the nearest sample, play it back, and then based on the difference in pitch and loudness, I would compensate for it. So I can talk about that a bit more later on, but the main idea is that if I find a match in the library, but it doesn't find, or in the corpus rather, and it isn't exactly the same pitch, I can now adjust for that. So if I turn both of these, actually if I turn both of these down, and this is just the nearest neighbor matching with some flute here. You know, it sounds all right, it's finding matches and it, it has a bit of the contour, but because of this accordion corpus doesn't have every single pitch involved, now if I turn the pitch compensation up and loudness compensation up, I get more like this. So it's more closely finding those samples. So that, that was a huge change in terms of the, the quality of concatenation that you can get out of SP tools now. In addition to that, once the quality got better, I decided to port over a bunch of the features that I had in CC Combine. So one of these is this glitch parameter. So what that does, is that it adds a probability of playing the same grain that you just had again. And it creates a sort of stuck um, glitchy sound. So I'll just turn this up and give you a listen. So I added that as one of the playback parameters. In addition to that, I added these transposition things. So what transpose does, it'll take the descriptor analysis that you did and then transpose it so you literally move them. So there it's just playing back um, basically an octave down. Then I have this pre-transpose, which is something that I worked out in CC uh, Combine, which was an interesting idea where you take the descriptors, it's essentially matching as if the corpus itself was transposed. So you get a different quality of sound. So what it's doing is trans it's acting as if the corpus itself was transposed. So if I had a corpus that was played at half speed, it would match like this. So the it's giving the pitch that it normally is, but matching the descriptors of the corpus lower. So it's kind of like this bassier, warmer kind of uh, sound that you get there. And on top of that, there's now controls for the radius and neighbors, which is the distance matching algorithm. So what this lets you do is it lets you be more selective or less selective with the samples played back. So if I put the radius small, it'll give me um, much less matches. And if I put the radius big, it will give me more matches. There's an article here that you can click and go on to the uh, Flucoma discourse, sorry, the Flucoma Learn platform and see how these two parameters interact. So by changing the amount of neighbors, you can see that it matches less. So the way that this sounds, so by putting the radius real small, it's, it will only match much more close matches, ones that are direct matches, and in effect makes the concatenation more sparse. And then neighbors behaves in a similar way. If you do want to know more, you can go on there to, to read more about it. But now you can control the way that parameters are matched. So that's some of the stuff on how to make, um, how the concatenation is just overall better in SP tools. One of the other updates in this version has been the UI objects have been overhauled. So there's been a descriptor display object here for a while that's been largely neglected. It, I initially had this um, like radar chart thing where there'd be two of them and you would kind of compare the descriptors and that was useful, but only to a certain extent. So what I've done now is completely revamped it. So what it, the way that it works, it will take the output of any of the descriptor objects in SP tools and map them for you. And it will adapt automatically. So I didn't set any parameters here. I just connect the output of whatever object I'm interested, 
both for the real time and the uh, onset based ones, both giving it lists or buffers, as well as the speed and controllers versions of descriptors. So it's just a useful way to see the, the descriptors that you have in a much more useful way. And on top of that, there's different sizes for them as well. So again, depending on the type of patching that you're doing, you may want a lot of UI feedback and now you can get it. And again, because of the scope idea, I wanted to take classifier display, which before was strictly just the sensor percussion snare and sensor percussion kick classes. That was cool, but it wasn't really useful for a lot of other things. So that's been completely revamped now as well. And along with how classification works now, when you load a class, it will automatically take out of the final, the last output of class match, which is new. If you connect that to classifier display, it'll just map those classes that were in there. So it means you don't have to worry about what classes you trained as long as you trained them the actual names will just get populated along. If you did close clusters, it'll be a zero one, or sorry, one, two, three. But if you did class names, they'll show up in there. And as I mentioned earlier, you can still use the sensor percussion class names. The, um, the layout is now different because there isn't room for all of them in the kind of pretty orientation that there were before. But there you go. It's now easier to use whatever type of classes you want. Now, this is something that applies to many of the objects, which I'll come back to uh, later on is that most things will now respond to, in this case, either class names. So if I'm triggering specific class names that was triggered as, or the class index, in this case, one, two, three, four, or a float position between zero and one. So this means it'll you can connect more objects to different objects and have them still operate. So rather than needing specifically to say that I want a, the rim shoulder sample to trigger here, um, I can send it the three or I can send it 0.5 in this case, depending on how many classes you have trained. So that's something about just the interoperability between objects in terms of descriptor ranges and in this like int ranges across the, the library. Another new function here is convolution. So there's now SP convolver. So this is powered by the hiss impulse response toolbox. So it's using multi convolve from that and shout out to Joe Staccato and Francesco Bigoni for helping me compile versions for SP tools specifically because of the way naming works. But SP Convolver gives you real-time um, zero latency convolution. So I can load, in this case, a reverb um, impulse response and get a nice spring reverb. So there's no shortage of convolution out there, so that's not particularly interesting. But one of the things that I wanted to add here was the ability to use it in a physical modeling-esque sense. So this is an old school approach to physical modeling where I can load, in this case, a, just a sample of a bell and just send audio through it as if it was a just a normal reverb, but instead you get this more responsive thing as if you're brushing a metal object in this case. Which gives it a kind of an interesting quality. And this is something that there's a whole other um, approach to sample playback, which I'll explain in a bit. Another one here is this mic correction. So the sensor percussion hardware is really great for getting offsets and has decent descriptor analysis for classification, but the audio sound of it is not very good. It's very high mid range. It can be quite noisy. So what I have now with convolution, one of the things that you can do is create mic correction. So I made a, a mic microphone correction correcting the sound of a sensor percussion pickup, so it sounds more like a DPA microphone. So I'll give you a, an A-B comparison here between them. You know, I mean, I wouldn't forego putting your normal snare mic, but it actually becomes a usable bit of audio that you can use, then use for processing. And this is zero latency here because it's the way that the convolution is working here. And here's um, an example where I'm applying convolution. Um, there's an object scatter, which I'll explain in a bit later, but what I'm doing is creating on every time there's an attack, it's gonna send one of the attacks to just a completely different impulse response. So in this case, there's 16 different impulse responses loaded. And depending on, um, in this case, it's gonna move from them uh, in order, actually, it'll move impulse response one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight.
And here's another musical example where I'm using the convolution for quieter sounds on uh, one of the bell samples. And then when the sound is above a certain level, it's gonna go instead to the corpus matching. So when I play quietly, it's gonna be the convolution on this um, an old bell. And when I play loud with the brushes here, it's gonna trigger a sample of uh, the Wuhan China corpus. So you can combine the functionality of a bunch of the different things in SP tools, in this case, convolution and corpus matching. And here we have corpus convolver. So since I added convolution, it means I can do a bunch of stuff with convolution. So the mic correction, the reverb and all that stuff, but I can also do this thing where rather than doing the normal corpus matching, where you analyze a corpus, you do descriptor analysis, and then you play back the nearest sample. What I can do instead, instead of playing back that nearest sample, I instead, load that nearest sample into the convolver and run the audio through the convolution. So it's kind of doing a per sample impulse response based on the script or analysis. It's kind of a tricky thing to explain, but it sounds like this. <laughs> So here we have the toy piano corpus and the vocals coming in and rather than it literally just playing back those samples, each sample is loaded as a polyphonic uh, impulse response convolution thing. So with that, you have control over some, um, because of how latency works, there is a, an impulse thing in there. So you have some controls over how to, the shape and contours of the impulse that will go along with the actual audio to trigger it. Um, but for the most part, you just get the sound of that uh, incoming audio, in this case vocals, activating that impulse response. And like all the other convolution stuff, you have control over the round robin stuff, whether it'll do a random variation per each one. You can select different time scales um, to have it match the corpus, com the corpus matching with. You can load setups like you would with corpus match. Uh, and you can filter as well. So select down to just a subset of the overall corpus. And then a musical example here where we have two different core pores, so the toy piano one and the china one, and then based on descriptor analysis, it's sending to one or the other. So you get something like this. So it's just an interesting way to get um, not just the corpus matching sound, but having almost like a something between corpus matching and almost physical modeling-esque uh, convolution with the sound to get this interesting hybrid approach. So that's Corpus Convolver. So now there's a bunch of objects that let you deal with audio processing, mostly in terms of breaking the sound down in different ways, so decomposing it and um, shooting it to different outputs. Um, and these are the S's, I guess I've just ended up calling them. So we have scatter, scramble, shatter, sift, and smear. And the first couple just made sense as an S, and then once I had a few, it just I committed, and now they're all with S names. So I'll give you a quick tour of all of these. So the first one we've got is Scatter. So what Scatter does, it takes onset detection, so whenever there's an onset that's detected, and then it sends the audio over to a new output. So I'm using the MC multi-channel audio stuff in Max 8 to do this. So what's coming out of Scatter is a blue cable. So you can see in this case there's eight channels of audio coming out of it. And every time there's a new attack, it's just gonna to move to a new output and a new output and a new output. And what that lets you do in this case is I'm applying a different effect on each output. So there's some overdrives, there's some uh, bit crushing, there's some reverb, there's a filter, some more bit crushing, and you get a different sound. You can obviously do whatever you want with these outputs, but in this case, I'm just basically moving from effect to effect. So if you think of um, having eight guitar pedals, but rather than being in series, um, they're in parallel, so eight parallel guitar uh, pedals, and every time there's an attack, it's gonna move the audio to the next one. And you get something like this. So you can do quite a few interesting things with here. On, on top of everything else, you get the channel output, you get the trigger, and you get the gate. So if you're doing cascaded processes, you can just tap into that there. So uh, in order to have it sound very crisp when it moves over, there's a tiny amount of latency by default, which is eight samples. 
So normally you won't even perceive this, but if you're doing something where you have direct audio, you might want to adjust this. So here's the direct audio with, um, you'll hear a little bit of phasing. But if you're doing something like a reverb, it actually literally doesn't matter. So it's, I just put in here to be aware of in that like the output that comes out of scatter has a latency of eight samples just to make it um, sound very smooth when you go from output to output. You can actually set the latency to zero if you want, but there's a tends to be a little bit of a click from the previous one when you do that. So the outputs, in addition to just going from output one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you can change the, the direction in which they move. So by default, it just moves up. I can instead have it go backwards. So it'll go down from six in this case. Or I can have it be random. So it depends on the type of processing you're using, what makes more sense for you. In addition to that, you can actually just set it as a sequence. So let's say I wanted to do, um, in this case, one, three, two, three, four, six, seven, five. I can send that prepended with sequence, and now it's going to do that order. Or I can go back to the normal order. So you can change the direction that that works. Now there's a separate input for scatter that lets you do manual triggering. Now, um, so this is useful if you're doing a cascaded process where you have another onset detector somewhere and you want to have them all happen <clears throat> um, at the same time. Or in this case, I'm going to use the cloud and trigger cloud to create a little kind of burst of activity afterwards and have it randomly do that. So you can see I've set manual to one. So that input is going to come in. So the onset detection here in this case is not working. It's only using the onset detection from there. So every time there's an attack detected here, it creates a cloud of triggers, which you can see in the display. It's producing some little noise blips, and then it's moving this through a filter bank. So this is just a bunch of resonant filters tuned to different frequencies here, and it's moving that. So the you get this cascaded thing from, of just filter bank just being shifted around very quickly, almost as if you had a knob and you're switching from channel to channel faster than you physically could. So one of the core things here that's useful is the fact that you can process stuff in different ways. So in this case, I've made five channels. I have five different types of processing in here, and I get a different sound every time there's an attack. So you make these interesting um, onset-based uh, signal processing lines with this. And here's a musical example where I'm using quite a few of the patches. So I'm doing some descriptor analysis. It's getting filtered based on pitch confidence and pitch. And then from there, it's getting shot out to different things. And inside each one of these, um, there are some scatters that are determining either filter bounces or um, like this shimmery panning process or something that goes to reverb. There's quite a few different things, uh, uses of scatter in here at a couple different levels. So you can kind of jump around here and see how that works. But that sounds like this. <laughs> Okay, so that's scatter. Next up we have shatter. So what shatter is doing, it's doing non-negative matrix factorization, which is a type of machine learning um, tuned decomposition. It's what's usually used for source separation where you have, let's say you've got a normal audio track and you want to separate stems from it and have like the drums and the bass and the guitar all separately. It's using a similar kind of algorithm for that. The implementation that I have here is a bit more general purpose. So it, I'll show you the examples of that. But what it lets you do is you, um, analyze an audio file ahead of time, in this case, some saxophone, and then I can break it into these components. So in this case, I've already analyzed one and I'm breaking it into three different layers. So that's what the sax sounds like on its own. And then here I can, you can see I have left and right and one, two, three. So if I turn these off, we're hearing just the lowest component of the saxophone. Or just the middle. And if I want, I can pan them differently. So to say I want to have the lowest one in the left, the middle in the right, 
And maybe both of them on the highs. Or if that's around, it just... But it decomposes it. And on top of that, you can see the output for each coming as multi-channel audio. We can see the activation amount for each. That's how active each component is, which the peak one is, or the most powerful one, and then the envelopes for each of the activations. So that's useful for some of the different processing you can do. So this you can um, do as a pre-analysis or you can seed it. I'll show you how to do the analysis separately. So you can seed audio directly into this using the seed function, or if you use shatter create, you can just create one of these analyses ahead of time. It tends to be faster to do that. It isn't super slow to seed it, but it, you know, it's much easier if you just do a create like you would with any other file, like corpus create, now you have a shatter create. So the, of the outputs that you get, you can get the activation amount as a list, but you can also get the activation amount as audio envelope. So here's a multi-channel audio output. So in this case, I'm gonna play um, back a drum machine sound that we can hear. So I'll load the deconstruction. So that's the actual audio and how it is decomposed. Now what I'm doing, I've made a simple resynthesis of it. So just a couple sine waves and noise. And I'm now using the activation envelopes to resynthesize this sound. So this is a very lo-fi thing, but just to show you how useful these activation envelopes are. So depending on the components, so let's say the low sound, the sort of hi-hat sound or the snare sound from this drum machine, um, each one is putting out an envelope, which you can then control stuff with. So I'll switch between them. So I'm literally just taking the output from that, the envelopes and using that to control the volume of the couple tune sound, uh, sine waves and um, sawtooth waves and noise. And it's pretty convincing resynthesis of it. So the, the activation envelopes can be used quite effectively that way. You can also transpose the filters, which is not something you can normally do with uh, NMF based composition, but it gives you just a, an ability to tweak where the filters are for each of the bands. So in this case, I'm playing just the low component. So it's kind of subtle, but I've just figured I'd offer that as a as a, something that you typically can't do. Now, when you have the different uh, decompositions, much like in Scatter, what you can do is then send each one to a different output. So in this case, I'm unpacking the multi-channel signal. I'm distorting one part and then processing the other part. So depending on the sounds that you have, you can treat them differently. So in this case, the high part is going to a separate scatter here that's doing some descriptor analysis, some convolution and some resonance stuff. Now here's what NMF is typically used for, which is source separation. So in this case, I've got a drum loop. So I've already loaded, uh, I've set it as an argument here where I have the, the shatter analysis done. Now I can enable and disable different parts of the sound. And again, because what's coming out is a multi-channel audio signal, you can treat each one differently. So if I want to take the sound and send the snare just to a reverb, put the hi-hat into a delay and put the kick into like a, a saturator, I can do that with the same audio and it's coming just through in real time. And now here's a musical example where I'm using the decomposition of a, a gong drum sample here and I'm sending part of it to a resonator and then the, the bright part of the decomposition, which in this case is hitting the rim of the drum, is then going to um, descriptor analysis for corpus matching. So there's only corpus matching happening on just that component of it. So the, I've done a decomposition, and then each part of that is doing its own audio analysis journey through the, the signal. So in addition to just decomposing the audio and using that as is, or decomposing the audio and processing each one separately, in this case I'm doing decomposition and then taking each component and then running it through its own descriptor analysis process and going from there. So that's Shatter. Real quickly I'll just show here Shatter Create. So I've got an audio file, let's say I want to create an analysis of it. I'll hit C to start recording, I'll play audio into it. And 
And then when I turn off the seed, it's now done that analysis. And number one, I can print the components or write it to disk. Following on with Shatter, we have Scramble. So what Scramble does, it takes multi-channel audio input. So in this case, I'm sending the output of Shatter, but it could be any multi-channel input. And based on onset detection, it will randomly assign the channels to different outputs. So here I've put this matrix control just so we can visualize it. Um, but by default, it will send about half of the channels and components will be panned in a stereo field. So that sounds like this. So you can see how at any at every onset, it's just enabling and disabling some of these channels. So at any given attack, we'll have some of the components of the sound in some of the speakers. You can adjust the width of that. So if you want it to be mono. And then you can set a ramp time. So rather than just switching from one to the other, you can control um, how quickly it does that. Similarly, we control the density of it. So if I want it to be less dense, so this is useful for scaling from between having almost no sound all the time. We have these little bursts to all the way to having just little holes being poked in the sound all the time. Um, the width I showed already, but it does sound kind of interesting. And then finally, the ramp will adjust um, the slew basically in doing that. So whether you want an instant cut or you want it to move smoothly from one to another. So the matrix control display updates instantly, but the slew is now moving between them. Up next, we have SIFT. So what SIFT is, it's essentially a onset based um, noise gate of sorts, where uh, by default there's 50% probability of when an onset is detected of that audio coming out or not coming out. So that's you SIFT between the audio that you're sending to it. Um, there's two outputs, so you get the audio that does come through the SIFT and the audio that doesn't. So in this case, it's the, the beatboxing example that you might have heard a couple times, but only 50% of the attacks are coming through. Now there's some controls here for the noise gate in terms of attack, hold, release, and curve, which you can tweak as you would in a typical noise gate, um, but I won't really go into that too much. Now, instead of sending by probability, I can also send it by every. So in this case, every fifth attack will come through. or combine them. So in this case, I can make it so like every fifth attack will have a 50% chance of happening. So you can see that happens uh, much less often. And like with other objects, you can get a trigger output and a gate output. In this case, you also get the envelope output. So if you wanted to use that to control another like side chaining type process. Like many of these other objects, there's also a trigger input. So in this case, sorry, a manual trigger input. So in this case, I have an offset detection going to the trigger bounce. That's coming to the manual input here. And then it's doing a panning kind of thing. So in this case, it's doing almost like a onset based tremolo where every time there's an attack, it's going to randomly pan for um, four bounces of that duration between left and right. And in this case, it's the reverb that's getting panned. Like in scatter, there's the same eight sample um, latency. So depending on the type of processing you're doing, but I found that with this, I get all the audio from the beginning. If I do it at zero latency, it still works, but you hear a little bit of a t -t -t at the start. Here's a selective processing. So just the when it passes a probability, it's going to this distortion thing. So only some of only 50% of the hits are getting that distorted, crunchy, reverby thing. And finally, a musical example.
Okay, so that's sift. And the final one of these is smear. So what smear does, it works off an envelope follower. And what it does, rather than per attack sending something to a different output, it gives you however many outputs that you define. So in this case, I have four channels and the envelope follower will pan across those four channels. So it lets you um, well, smear the audio across the, those channels. So it looks like this. <laughs> So depending on where the envelope follower is, it's coming out one of four outputs. And here we have controls for the envelope follower. So there's an envelope follower, which I'll explain later on, but you have your attack, your decay, offset, and all that. Um, and what this lets you do, you can do a few different things. In this case, I'm gonna be cross-fading depending on the volume of the incoming signal between different reverbs. So in this case, there's a small dark reverb being cross-faded to a large bright reverb. And in this case, they're also panned. So you get like a left to right thing. So in this case, not only do we get a panning type sound, but since it's two different impulse responses, it's almost like um, each part of the signal is, has its own reverb thing and it's moving, moving between them in a very smooth or an organic way. This can be used for something like physical modeling. So in this case, I have the Convolver doing three, well actually in this case, four different um, Wuhan China samples going from a very quiet one to a medium one to a very bright one and depending on the on the input audio it activates the different one so it's like the physical modeling but um a little bit more realistic and at each level of the, the the amplitude it goes to a different impulse response <laughs> So you can hear only when the attack is really bright, you get that really bright push, push sound from the, the China. So it crosses, it cross fades between them. So in this case, it's uh, convol convolution and Wuhan China samples, but the output could be anything. All smear does, it takes the input and just smears it across the various outputs. Now in this example here, I'm taking some vocal audio input and sending it through and also four, but four very different audio effects. So that sounds like this. <laughs> And to kind of show what's happening here, I can put this in manual mode, so it basically ignores the internal offset detection, or sorry, internal envelope follower, and I can instead scrub between the effects. But I'll do this now so you can hear what effect is at each range. <laughs> So in this case, it's like if you have four guitar pedals and you're morphing between one and the other based on your volume. It's almost like a, an expression pedal type thing, but done with an envelope follower. So here it is again, fighting from a, a filtered, like a low pass resonant filter through a bunch of different distortion types as it goes up. <laughs> And here I'll just play a bit of this one. This is doing uh, that sort of canonical uh, guitar distortion where at different levels, if you play very quietly, it's a very small amount of distortion. If you play loud, it's a lot of distortion. So there's a very overdrive with mild, a lot, and then a ton of gain, and then just a little bit of a reverb on this last one, in this case being driven by flute. So in this case, it's doing that very touch sensitive distortion. So depending on how loud you are, there's actually more distortion. And in this case, also only the loudest sounds get reverb. So that's smear. And now into some of the core improvements. So one of the things that I did is I revamped how the onset detection works. So if I open up SP onset, as I mentioned in the opening, the sensitivity and all that stuff has been tuned to work across a wider range of material. But in addition to that, we have a couple different onset detection algorithms now at play. So you have your amplitude based onset detection, which is SP onset as we've always had. Now there's spectral onset, which is a spectral onset based detector, which I'll explain in a moment. And we have novelty, which we had before. 
part of what's new here is in unifying the names as I did, as I explained in the beginning, these parameters of sensitivity and lockout apply to all of the algorithms. So you can use this paradigm of how sensitive the algorithm is and how, um, how much time you want to lock out between when you can have new attacks and just apply that across a bunch of different places. In addition, you can come here to the uh, Flucoma Learn and see about the different algorithms and how they work, both in terms of the onset-based ones, uh, rather the amplitude ones, the spectral ones, and the novelty. So each one is focused on a different type of thing, and you can read more about that there. So the input modes, and now in SP onset, it's kind of different because this one doesn't do any buffer-based processing, but you do have control over having uh, different filters depending on whether you're doing um, a sensor percussion, uh, drum trigger, or just raw audio mic. And what you can see here, I'll play this audio clip and you can see the difference if I set the input mode to one, where it puts the filter that I found very useful for sensor percussion, you get a lot more onsets at this one on the right. So it just gooses the high frequency a little bit, which gives the onset detection algorithm a little bit more to bite onto. Now, if we go to instead onset frame and by proxy uh, descriptors, melbands, all the descriptor analysis objects that use onset frame as their core, within them, you have now a mode you can select. So there's an amplitude based mode or a spectral mode, and that applies to all the objects. So if I come here to MFCCs, if I come over to mode, I can see that I can set MFCC mode to amplitude, which is the default algorithm as it's been, or instead if you want to use spectral onset, you just put mode spectral. And it's a different onset detection algorithm. It just focuses on different things. But that's across all of the descriptor objects, starting from onset frame, which is at their core. And then finally, with onset detection, I revisited SP novelty. And in addition to naming things sensitivity, so things are more uniform across the board, you now have control for um, window, lockout, smoothing, and a few different things and there's now a visualizer to help you tweak these parameters a little bit better. And if you wanted to, you can come into the advanced settings and now there's on and off thresholds, minimum slice, kernel and filter size. You can get in here and really tweak things if you want just to really uh, fine tune stuff. So I expose all of those as parameters now so you can much more fine tune the onset detection that you have across all of SP tools. In addition to combining some processes just for ease of use, I've also combined some of the processes that we already have, but to make new things that you can do. So there's now Corpus Cluster Match, which takes the clustering that was already in SP Tools and Corpus Matching that was already in SP Tools and combines them into a new thing. So I can load a Corpus, so in this case, the Voice Corpus. Now what this does, instead of allowing me to match the nearest match based on descriptor analysis, which is how it's used elsewhere. It clusters that audio by however many I want. So if I want four clusters or the default is eight. Now, what I can do is I can send an input. So if I send the number one, it'll play me any sample from that one cluster or input two or three or four. So what it lets me do is that it lets me load a corpus as I would, but instead of having to map individual ones, I can instead use a cluster. So, and it'll randomly select from that choice. Now um, I can pick the amount of clusters. So let's say three. And you can also pick how they're sorted. By default, they're sorted by centroid, but they can be sorted by loudness or pitch or none, which will be random essentially. Now, much like with uh, Corpus Match, you can change the time scale that you're matching on, and that'll affect how things are clustered. By default here, it's the medium one. You can set it to be all or short, and just affects how things are clustered. Wow. So this is basically the analysis window that we're looking at for each one, respectively. You can filter the audio, as you can with other ones. So if I want to only have the loud sounds, it'll still do the clustering as you would with anything. So all the stuff that you have with cluster match, you can still do. Now, one thing that's kind of different here is that you can now seed the corpus clustering. So I can load a corpus. Now, instead of telling it to give me three clusters, which it did by default, let's say I wanted to give me how many clusters are in this snare training. 
if I load this snare training classifier file, so this is one that I created with class create, you can see that it made, in this case, there's four classes in there. Or in this beatboxing example, I think I have three. Yeah, so you can see it's three classes. So you can use a classifier training that you've done, which will not only set the amount of clusters that you have, but it also uses the, um, the descriptor analysis that was involved in that initial classification and uses that as a seed to cluster stuff. So let's say I have um, a corpus in mind and I have a specific set of classes, that, you know, certain sounds that you're making with whatever instrument you're using. You can use those to seed the clustering. And now here for the musical example. So I've loaded a corpus of a bunch of random drum sounds. All right, and I've got a bunch of kicks, hi-hats, and snares. So now I can play with my keyboard. I can play a kick, snare, and a hat, but every time I play a kick, it'll select a new random one from that cluster, which is kind of cool. So I can play a beat. And have the sounds evolve over time which i can then connect to other processes so here i have a classifier with the beatbox training so when the beatboxer does a bass drum sound it's going to pick a new random kick or a hi-hat or a snare or in this example i have a drum machine where the pattern stays the same but every time it hits a kick it'll be a different sample I've also now added integration for the Keith McMillan bot pad. So if you have a bot pad, there's now a bot pad preset here that you can load up into your uh, bot pad interface thing to put it on your bot pad. And what we have is this mapping where you can see I've mapped things. So the paradigm I took is if you take like an NPC style thing where you have different rows, I took these quadrants and then I mapped it. So essentially you have these MIDI notes going from the center to the edge and work like this. So in effect, you have 16 notes that you can trigger from the bot pad, as well as an XY position, which I'll explain, and then after touch and global parameters. So you have all that things mapped. So the first thing we have note output. So um, you can trigger any of these notes. In this case, I'm quantizing it, quantizing it to get a baseline, but we get something like this. And having access to the different quadrants this way, it, it feels kind of organic. I've, I've, get, I've tried to get the mapping and the transitions to feel as nice as they can on the bat pad. Um, it is kind of small in space and the resolution isn't super great, but you can play 16 notes pretty consistently. Another thing I wanted to add was this idea of being able to navigate a corpus. So I can load a corpus and I have the grid match as I've had before, but now I'm triggering it with the bot pad. <coughs> Now I've added this spread parameter. So if I have the spread parameter at zero, because in the bot pad in reality, I only really have these diagonal lines. So if I move from the center of the edge, you can see I can only really trigger that way. So my way around that is if by adding a bit of spread, what it does, it adds a little bit of random noise. So as I move this direction, it moves and adds a little bit of stuff. So if I move that same direction as I did before, if you see here on the bottom, rather than being a straight line, it wiggles around a bit. So without it, it's literally just those samples. And with it, if I crank it all the way, it's essentially a random position in that quadrant. And then you have aftertouch in each quadrant separately. And then finally, global outputs. So the global outputs give you a global initial radius, so that's sort of a strike position, global velocity, which is global to the whole thing, and then pressure. And you can use these in addition to the ones that you get out of each individual quadrant. So the um, aftertouch from each individual quadrant can be used in addition to the global ones. And you get something like this. Now, along with grid match, I added a new object called 
grid scale. So that lets you take the output of any grid based or 2D based approach, so which can be using um, the bot pad, the area touch or a mouse thing and map it to a different scale. So if I just use my mouse here on the screen, I'm using the whole of that range. But the same thing with the bot pad. Using the whole of that range, what I can then do instead is using these shortcuts and change that. So if I put this fake controller data to work here, so I can use the whole space or and even though this is moving around the whole space, I'm now only matching this smaller subset of it. And I can do the same with the bot pad. So with the bot pad, because it's crude in terms of the resolution you get, instead of having everything, let's say I'm only really interested in the samples that are in this corner, I can shrink it down and now I can play the bot pad and play only those samples. So it lets you scale everything to that range. So one of the features I wanted to add in this one was quantization. So there's two new objects here. So if I scroll down to them, we've got quantize pitch and quantize time. So open quantize pitch first. What this does, it lets you just quantize the incoming descriptors or whatever you want to a specific scale and key. So in this case, there's a LFO just moving around. And if I trigger this, and it's quantizing that to be in a perfect key. Now if I want, I can change that to a different key or a different scale of which there's a ton of them here, but I can also adjust the amount of quantization. It's almost like an auto tune. So with nothing, it's gonna be triggering the LFO um, and you get these sort of in-between notes. in the input could be anything. In this case, we can take um, from descriptor outputs and give it an int or a float or lists or buffers. The amount parameter, as I said before, is kind of like a auto-tune-esque thing. So you can, just having it off, it'll give me um, essentially no quantization. In which case it's matching the pitch of this incoming audio as closely as it can. But if I turn it up, it'll auto-tune it in this case to a, like a major key, which is not what's happening for the input. So you can create like these auto-tune-esque effects by controlling that. So for the scales, there's loads of scales built in. So these are the ones that come with um, beep, although some of them had mistakes in it, which I fixed. Um, but there's a whole bunch of scales here, or you can just type in one manually. So if I want to create a specific scale, I can just give it these values. And now it's set to that specific scale. So you can, in addition to using all these scales from the list, you can create your own one by just giving a, a set of pitch classes. And finally, here's a, a musical example where it's taking audio analysis of the flute input and then using the scale that the flautist is playing in a program that in here is a scale and the key. And it does a little um, ramp flourish every time there's a pitch match. So it, it matches the, the flautist and then does a little additional ornamentation each time. And we also have quantize time. So quantize time is, is you're probably somewhat familiar with um, when you have tempo matching. So in this case, I can take audio samples or any inputs of bangs, triggers, gates, whatever it is. I can set a tempo, a quantization step interval. I can even tap tempo in if I want, and it'll make all of the samples that come out be at that. So in this case, it'll be a tempo of 100. 
and it'll be quantized to 16th notes. So those typical values that you might see. Now the quantization can happen both local or globally. So if I have local quantization, meaning that each instance of um, the time quantize is happening separately here. So that's inside the melody one here. They're both just chaotically um, in their own world. Now if I want to, I can set it to global instead. And if I turn on the, the global transport here, so when you set it to global, you have to use the, the transport, which is also down here in the, the toolbar. And now they're gonna, both going to be in time with each other. And that'll, that'll be the case regardless of how many of these you have. So if you have a patch with you know 15 of them, they'll all be in time with the global transport if you set it that way. In terms of input, you can take bangs, triggers, and then also any of the descriptor types will come through as well, which is useful for quantizing um, any kind of data, not just uh, onsets and stuff. So I have an example I've shown already, but I've got a drum loop going, I've got a um, sample of a melodic Wurlitzer playing, and the quantization is being set here. So as I, regardless of the, the rate at which I play the, the keys, if I'm out of time, it'll get quantized to this 16th note um, grid. So following off from quantization, we've got some sequence stuff in here. So there's a sequencer clock or sequence clock and sequence data. So rather than having a sequencer, you have these two components which you can combine if you want. But sequence data, um, much like the convolution, there's no shortage of sequences that are out in the world. But I found that I couldn't find one that worked with any kind of input. So on its default, you can just give it a list and it'll work like any old sequencer. So. I've got a pitch sequence here, and in this case, it's being driven by onsets from the incoming flute analysis. And I can, you know, forward, reverse, all the kind of stuff that you might get with a typical sequencer. But where this starts getting interesting is that rather than having um, individual notes, I can store whole sets of descriptors or buffers or lists or anything. So if I play some audio here and I... I've basically recorded in that descriptor data. So as stored in the sequencer is now these lists of descriptors, or in this case, a list of buffers or whatever it is. So this is useful for um, creating sequences of more complex or multidimensional data as we have in SP tools. So if you wanna have a sequence where each step of the sequence is a huge list of descriptor values, you can do that now. So you're not necessarily limited just having individual lists. So if you do this and that's fine and you can draw your notes and you'll get at that step, you'll get that specific pitch. But I want it to be able to have at this step, I have these in this case three buffers so a whole each one of them represents a huge chunk of data so that's one of the things that i wanted to add in terms of that now the way that the sequencer data can be moved forward is you can send it control it with a trigger you control it with a bang or you control it with um, integers directly so if i send just a metronome or i can do with in this case onset detection or if I want to send individual steps, I'll go to step one or step five. So I can jump to specific steps of what I want. And again, the data in this case is notes, but it can be buffers or whatever. Or I can use a float between zero and one. So this is going back to the idea of this interoperability between objects. So in this case, I have some um, drums coming in, doing descriptor analysis and extracting the controllers. Now I'm using the slope of loudness to select where in the sequence I'm playing back. So the step in the sequence that's being played back is 
directly being driven by audio descriptors in this case, which is kind of a interesting feature that you don't really typically see. And beyond that, I had these two things of rest and skip probability, which are consistent across both the data and the clock version. So I'll explain what these are briefly. So by default, uh, with the rest probability, it's just everything is max all the time, and I get something like this. Actually, I'll do it with just the metro. Now, what rest probability does, this is a multi-slider here. So I'm going to give it a list where, let's say, for these steps, it's going to be a rest. So when it gets to those notes, you'll still see the sequence moving along, but we won't hear the note. But instead of having that say fully off, let's say I wanted to have those steps to be 50% of the time they'll sound. So you get these interesting sub patterns where per step there's a probability of that happening or not. And you can do whatever probability list that you want. So you can have something like this. And in this case, the sequence will always be consistent. will have different notes sounding or not sounding based on the rest probability mask. Skip is similar, but instead of being just silent for that note, it will instead skip that note. So if I do something like this, what we'll do is get something. You see it's skipping them all the time, but if I put this at 50% of the time, They work similarly, except this one will basically not output. And this one will still output, but it'll just skip that value. And then with these, in addition to that, you can also set a range. And you can also read and write these sequences, which is not especially necessary if you're just drawing in notes, but if let's say I have a whole bunch of buffer, or sorry, a whole bunch of descriptor data. So in this case, I've recorded a sequence using a bunch of descriptor data, which I now I'm gonna play back using the audio onsets from this. So this was a sequence of using the prepared snare sample that's elsewhere, um, the descriptor analysis from that, but now being triggered by just a completely different instrument. And if you want it, in this case, there's also a bit of a melody going on the side where I've set a sequence, I've set a, uh, an attribute for rest probability and skip probability. So there's this whole separate sequence happening here in addition to the uh, corpus matching that's happening on the left. And finally, here's a musical example where I have um, four of these sequencers controlling a mangrove inspired by the whimsical raps mangrove oscillator. Um, with the quantizer. So there's a pitch thing that's being set randomly, a rhythm one, which I'll explain the clock one in a bit. And then there's two separate sequences for the formant and the barrel. And if you can maybe tell here, but these are all different value, different amount of steps. This is 16 steps, that's 15, this is 14, and this is 32. And that sounds like this. <laughs> So having a bunch of sequencers lets you chain things this way. This is more of a modular synth type uh, implementation of the idea, but again, at each step of the sequence, it can be descriptive data or any old data that you want. And the partner to sequence data is sequence clock. So this works similarly in that we have um, controls over the direction it can go. You can tell it the steps and the position that it gives you. We have this rest and skip probability as we do with the sequence. But the difference now is rather than storing data per step, it stores an onset timing. So if I just start the clock, so here at the bottom I have a sequence data, so it's playing the same sequence from the other example, but here I have a set of timing. So if I put this all really fast, I 
and I can move forward, backwards, or uh, random. But I can also control this with the weight and rate. So this is a little bit inspired by with the um, no control from um, make noise. So if I control this. If I set the weight to no, actually, let me put a more chaotic uh, rhythm here with a lot of variation. So if I play that normally, it sounds like this. A lot are starting to stop. As I turn the weight down, what it does, it takes the average of that value and makes that kind of a, uh, at 0%, it'll just be a consistent tempo, which is the average of all of these. So weight controls how much this specific distribution is applied. So if you put it 50%, it won't be as heavy the difference between the long ones and the short ones. And then rate does what it says on the tin and you can go faster. Now in this, you can record directly. So if let's say I wanted to um, record a sequence, so I can hit record, hit play. Okay, so now those points are saved as a rhythm, which I can then use to trigger the sequence. So now when I play it back, you'll hear that same exact rhythm. The rest and skip I already explained and the range I already explained. Uh, read and write is similar. I can just read, uh, in this case, a sequence that I've done already and just play that back. And then the musical example here is the same as before. So here I've got the rhythm thing, which is set to 32 channels. So you can hear that the rhythm is now looping, but the rest of the sequences are moving on in their own thing. some interesting patterns from that. So these are a couple under the hood changes, but you might notice that when you load files, if I go here to let's say a corpora, every file now has a header. Because now there's so many different types of files that you can load. You can load corpora, you can load concat stuff, you can load sequences, uh, it can get a little, you can load shatter things. So in terms of telling each one apart, each one when you open it will say what it is. So this is a concat corpus analysis file. So if I come to this one, this one is a corpus sampler analysis file. If I come over here and go to MISC, um, here's a sequence data, here's a sequencer clock. So each one now tells you what it is. So that makes it uh, a bit more clear in terms of what files are what. And at the moment, it doesn't prevent you from loading the wrong files, it just won't work. But in future updates, I'm gonna make it so when you load a setup, it's gonna check to make sure that it is a setup file. And then if it is, it'll load it. Um, and then a lot more objects now have dump and print things that they didn't before. So for example, if I load class match, class match now has a dump output. So if I load this class training, I can see here all the classes that I've trained. So in this case, it's a, like a full sensory percussion setup. Um, I have all the points and all the other classes. It tells me how many classes there are, the indexes, the class means, and if I send a print, It'll tell me how many entries there are total, how many classes there are total, the names of them, how many hits per class. So you can see I did about 50 to 60 for most of them. These I did less. Um, whether I've trained the neural network, which I'll explain in a bit, and then um, some more data. So this is across all the objects. So all the objects will have a print or a dump outlet of some way just to give you a bit more information about what's going on under the hood with that. So if you go to something like Corpus Match, things like setups, when you load a setup, whereas before, I had to load a setup and then enable it. Um, you no longer need to do that. If you just load a setup, it automatically becomes enabled, which just to streamline things. And as I showed in the opening, if you put an argument, so corpus voice, and I do um, setup snare, that's good to go. Like all those files are already loaded and this will behave as it should. 
and that's the case for every single file that um, would load every type of abstraction that loads files. So even I go to one of the classifiers, so if I go to class match again, I can read it in, but instead of I want, I can just load it by default. So beat box training, and it already loaded. That's across all the abstractions that lets you load files. All the files can now be set as arguments. And as I mentioned in a couple of the examples now, the having a unified range of values. So every object will set out a range between zero and one or one and a value. So if I open up something like SP sampler again, I can trigger what sample gets played just by the descriptor analysis itself. Having this uniform namespacing, it lets you do stuff where you can use um, audio descriptors to select what sample is getting played back either by setting a number one, two, three, four, five, or by sending a range between zero and one. You can also use that range to select what class is being played or use a classifier to select uh, to play a melody or use controller input to determine uh, the position in a sequence. So all of these things are now made to, to operate with those values. So you can send from one to another and it will work across the whole library this way. So the classification has gotten a pretty stark improvement here as well. The way classification has worked in SP tools is using a nearest neighbor. So you train the classes. So in this case, let's say I'm gonna train, I'm gonna say this is a beatbox, you're doing a kick sound. Okay, and I've trained it and now those samples will work. Okay, so that's the same as it's always been, but what I've added now is there's an optional neural network. So um, if I wanted to, I'm gonna train here with some sensor percussion type sounds. So I'll train on, put the center. Ideally, you'll do that more thoughtfully than I did. Um, but instead of just doing done, which is now already trained, if I wanted to, I could train an MLP. So what this is, is a multi-layer perceptron. It's a neural network. So we'll put this to train here in the background. And what it does, it just does a neural network instead of the nearest neighbor classifier. And I found that in my testing, this is, um, it's more accurate. So it's 10% more accurate roughly, but it is twice as fast. So in terms of when the audio input comes in and it turns to descriptors, you'll get a match from the classifier faster than you would before. So when you're creating your classifier, um, if you take a moment just to train the MLP, you can see that was pretty quickly. And then if I print here, you can see that it shows that MLP has been trained. Now if I write this file, um, snare with MLP, that's now saved. And if I load that, it will automatically use the neural network classifier. So this is a case for the clustering and the classification now have this neural network version. Now, if I come to class match, if I load a classifier file that already has that MLP involved, it'll use the neural network version. If you haven't trained it, it'll use the default version. So if you just take a bit of time to train the neural network, you'll just get better results overall. And if you want to, you can still select between them. So if I want specifically to use the K nearest neighbor, I can use the algorithm or you can switch the MLP, which is the multi-layer perceptron, which is a neural network. Um, but by default, I, I, the MLP I found in all circumstances works better, but you have that as a choice if you want. All of the synthesis modules that were added in the uh, previous update now have an additional mode where instead of just being onset based, you can use it as a continuous sound source. So now there's these modes where you have real time onset or combine so if I send um, the way it worked before, if I just put this, let's say to onset, it sounds like this. Actually, let me pick this bit in the middle. It triggers it. Now, if I put it to real time, instead of waiting for an attack to run through the algorithm, it's instead just sending audio through it the whole time and you get this more uh, physical model-y type thing as you do with a convolution. And if you wanted, you can do a combination of both. So if I put it maybe around here. Okay. 
So it's doing the, the continuous version, and then when you give it a hard strike, it does the onset-based version. And this applies to all of the synthesis ones. So the Waveguide Mesh one, it's also quite nice and carpless strong. So I come to the input mode here. So in the real-time mode, you get this. sounds quite cool with other instrument input. In this case, it's all drums, but it can be any input and you get this uh, cool activation of the, the models. So that's across all of the synthesis ones. Up next, we have slice curve. What this lets you do, it lets you take integer inputs and map it to a zero to one space, but with an arbitrary amount of steps and curves. So here by default, it's set to 16 steps with a curve of zero. So it lets me do something like this. You can see it's divided that space evenly into 16. Instead, I want to have 8 or 7 or 19 or whatever. Um, but where this gets interesting is you can affect the curve of it. Meaning, if I put the curve around here, it's divided that space. Or if I hit 1, it's no longer an evenly divided space. And you can do this for whatever you want. So let's say I want to have seven steps and I want them to be distributed this way. It gives you a, a kind of a useful way to map that space. And given what I said before of this interoperability, in this case, it's being used to jump around a sample, but you can use this to instead map a controller space. So let's say I want to have the output of one of the controller objects, which in this case is giving me, let's say I have five classes trained. Um, but I want to map that across this much of a space and have more detail in this area as opposed to having it be evenly spaced. So you can do things like that. So you can affect the amount of steps you get. You can set the base at 36. And the curve you have as we saw here. So you can just affect how that stuff goes in the space. So here I have the curve that I can spread around the space differently. In this case, I'm using controller match, which I'll explain in a bit but I'm mapping um, this input space to a corpus. So I've mapped the corpus along a single line and I want to control how I want to navigate that instead of having 16 equal steps. Red, red, red. Let's say I want to have more detail at the start. I can put this like this and have most of my button presses be in that range. Or the opposite. Or most of them are near the other side. There's also now a Schmidt filter. So uh, Schmidt filter is very similar to filter that we've had for a while, but what a Schmidt filter adds, it adds um, hysteresis. So instead of just having a threshold of which you can go above or below, what hysteresis is, you can set a separate high threshold and a separate low threshold. So this is useful if you have something that's kind of jittery or you have, in this case, like real-time uh, descriptor analysis that, let's say, if I set a threshold at negative 20 dB, my audio might be very near that all the time and just false triggering it. So with something like this, I can set a filter. Uh, let me put the concatenation on. I can put the filter here so when there's a descriptor, it'll only match when it goes above this value and then below this one. So if it's just kind of hovering here, it won't do anything. And if it's hovering here, it won't do anything. So in this case, I have concatenation go with the drum file, which I can map to different things. So in this case, only sounds that go above 15 dB and then below 30 dB after. Now in this case, only brightness that goes above that and then below this one. Or flatness, so it goes above that and below that. Or you can do combination. So in this case, loudness that goes above that and the centroid going above that. And just like in with SP filter, you have a output for when the criteria is met, and then there's a separate output for when the criteria is not met. So we can use that to do other values. So here we have a musical example where when things don't pass the Schmidt filter, so when they're below it, it's going to be going through a convolver with a, a prepared piano note as like a single resonant body. 
And when it meets the criteria, it's instead going to be triggering this concatenation. So you get kind of a mix of uh, processes happening. <laughs> So you can see in this example, the audio is kind of teetering in that area, but having the Schmidt filter means it only goes true when it goes above it and then below it. So you get less false triggering. Otherwise, other, the whole time it would just be like in that middle range, just triggering the whole time. There's been a couple uh, nice improvements to the way triggering works. So there's now a trigger length which lets you take uh, incoming triggers and gates and just make them longer if you wanted. Which you combine with other processes. And now there's also trigger shape, which is an attack hold release envelope. So it can take a trigger input or a bang input and you can set the attack hold and release, which is useful as just an envelope setting thing across the, the, the library. You can have control over the um, curve for the attack and release separately if you want. And here's a musical example that's using trigger shape as a side chain with the parameters of scaling and offsetting. And it's gonna be side chaining this low uh, growly synth bass based on the drum triggering input. So now we have a couple different ways that we can trigger samples and melodic material. So there's two new objects here, which are first is controller match, which controller match is like corpus match and grid match. It, it, it takes a, a corpus of samples and spreads it across a space. What controller match does, it spreads that across a line. So if, you can use plotter, but it looks a little funny because it turns into the squiggle. But the idea is that you can then browse it with a continuous thing, which can be um, either mouse control on the interface, or you can use a zero to one parameters you can elsewhere in the library. So here I'm using the descriptor analysis of this acoustic guitar to browse through the samples here. So instead of using the descriptors to find it, it's using the position of it, which is kind of a useful thing that you can do with some of the other parameters and you can use with slice curve or with any of the other things to intermix between stuff. Much like with corpus match and grid match, you have round robin. So if I enable this here and by default, if I click on the same spot over and over, it adds a random variation. So you can see it doesn't match the same sample. So you avoid that machine gun stuck sound. Otherwise you can turn it off and get that sound. By default it's on, but it's a useful thing just to give it a little bit more variety when you're matching the same thing. And you can do um, the matching by different time scales as you can elsewhere as well by short, medium, and all, long. And you can also do the same filtering. So if you wanna only just have different descriptors, it'll still put them in that line. So only long sounds in this example. Or only quiet ones. And then controller pitch does something similar, but for melodic material. So you have controller input, and then that range is instead of finding samples within a corpus, it'll spread them across a scale and key that you decide and a range in which you decide. So the default is in the key of C with the major scale, going from middle C up two octaves. So that gives you something like this. So the position of the, the that particular descriptor coming out of controllers will set the, the melodic thing. So if I scroll up and down, it would just move up and down a melodic phrase within that. And here's a quick musical example that's using SP Sampler's transposition. So I'm transposing a single sample and then using a sequencer um, to play a low bass line melody along with it, as well as some scatter stuff to add some reverb here randomly every now and again.
and there's a few utilities now for uh, massaging descriptors a bit further. So we've had the data, data bending and all that stuff for a while, but now there's a couple other ones. So you can do descriptor curves. So what descriptor curves does, it lets you take incoming values and either rescaling them to changing from one unit to another. So from dB to amplitude to velocity or MIDI to frequency. And in addition, apply a curve to them. So on the left, we have the descriptors that are raw, but if I wanted, I could change this to have a different curve. You can see now the loudness is a little bit hotter than the other one. So as you would adjust curves in most other things, but now you can do this per the different descriptors. You can also convert units, as I said, so I can go, uh, let's say I want my loudness to be in amplitude and I want my this to be in frequency because I'm gonna control a synth. So here they are in dB and then MIDI, and here they are in amplitude and frequency. So it's just another way to transform things from one to another. You have the curves, which you can set individually for each. And if you wanted to, you can set individual scale values. So in this case, I'm taking the loudness scale and saying when it's from negative 120 to zero, instead scale that to negative 40 to negative 20. So it gives me the whole loudness range and it just kind of smushes it up in that louder range. And then here I'm doing something similar with centroid where I'm taking these br this brighter range, but transposing it to be darker. So I have this same descriptor input, but I'm just using the scale function to shift where those descriptors fall. So you can see these are kind of smushed in those respective areas. And then finally, here's a musical example where I'm just shifting some of those things about. So I'll just have the matching going. <laughs> So you can see by pulling this forward, I'm basically making the input just a lot brighter over, sorry, a lot louder overall. So just shifting the, the, the curve of that. So descriptors curves is useful for just moving the descriptors around, changing units and transforming and scaling them. So just shoving them about. And then we have descriptor replace which lets you replace individual descriptors in a, a descriptor buffer, or descriptor list. So in this case, I'm gonna take the pitch. So I have a gong drum here. So the pitch analysis is not giving me useful pitch information. If I put it to the default, I get something like this. I get these kind of just random pitch notes from the toy piano. If I put it to the replaced one, I'm then using the sequence of pitches. So I'm using the sequence data with these preset pitches and a random selection. So on the left, you'll see the replaced version. So if you look at the pitch column here versus the original. So instead of that random set of pitches before, now I get this more melodic thing from the sequence. Now, there's a little caveat to that in that because the way that corpus match is working, it's matching across all descriptors. So it's not gonna 100% find those matches, but it'll replace the pitch with what, uh, whatever it is you want. In this case, leaning it towards this melodic thing. And now there's an envelope follower as well. So SP envelope. So it's a typical envelope follower where you have your attack decay and all that kind of stuff. The only thing, there's a few extra bells and whistles here so you can offset it and scale it, which you might be used to from modular stuff. And you can also determine what happens at the edge of it, whether it folds, wraps, or clips. So I'll just show you that. So it's basically an envelope follower with some bells and whistles. And with the way that it's set up, that where you get the envelope, you get a gate, and you get an inverted gate output, you can do a lot of typical um, dynamic processing. So in this case, a noise gate type thing. Or a compressor. Or a side chain. or an expander in this case. So you can do quite a few of the, the typical dynamic processing things from depending on how you set these values, whether you set the offset and the scaling of it. 
and having these different rap modes lets you do some interesting behavior when it gets to the top, whether it's going to jump around. So it's, it's an envelope follower, which I needed for smear and a few other things, but I figured I'd just pimp it out and give it a, a couple interesting features to make it a bit more useful overall. And now for a few speed run changes. Corpus Player now has reverse jump and loop parameters, so I can loop samples. You can also jump around a sample. And when you're playing samples back, you can play them back at uh, reverse speed. All the real-time descriptors objects now have smoothing built in, so rather than being jumpy, you get this. And you can set the amount of smoothing that you want. All the descriptor-based objects now have time-aligned trigger and gate outputs. Before, it would delay them so they would line up where they should be, but descriptor analysis is a non-deterministic process, so it can take a you know, variable amount of time. So now there's a new abstraction built in that will automatically make it so the trigger and gate happen exactly when the output of the descriptors are. SP controllers handles default values better, so when you start it off, it, you'll get more relevant results right away. <laughs> You can now trigger most of the objects with bangs as well as triggers. Melbend transposition in data transpose now sounds better. If you use pure data, there's a lot more abstractions now. So that's all the stuff that's new in version 0.9. So quite a lot of stuff. Now, if you've made it this far, that means you probably like SP tools quite a bit. So um, because of the scope of the project and how things are changing, I figured um, if people want to help out or get involved, there's a lot of ways to do that. So if, um, if you want to contribute to the project, there's a few things that I'm not particularly good at that would be great to have people involved that are. So in general, having uh, musical examples and videos and stuff like that, if you've made music with SP tools, Shoot me some, shoot me an email, send me a video. It'd be great to involve it and include it in the inspiration section. I think that I want to build that out over time. If you use per data quite a bit and want to help out, get in touch. It, it'd be great to involve uh, more people with that, but just because I do do some pure data programming, but uh, not a ton. And it'd be great to turn more of these abstractions over into pure data versions and have more vanilla friendly versions that can run on a Bella. And specifically things like sample playback or um, like polyphonic sample playback and some of the synthesis parameters. In general, it'd be cool to have more of the things that you can do with SP Tools stuff happen in pure data. Max for Live devices. All the Max for Live devices have been updated to the new abstractions. I haven't added any new Max for Live devices. And it's at a position where I personally don't use Live a ton. So it'd be great if someone who did use Live some would have more uh, input in terms of how some of the stuff is enigmatically done. For example, like all the S stuff, like scatter, shatter, smear, and all those things that have multi-channel output. I know Live handles multi-channel output but I don't really know what idiomatically how people do that, like how, how you go about doing that in a conventional way. So it would be cool to have something like Scatter where onset based, it just sends it out to different outputs and you can have different buses set up in live, but I don't really know idiomatically what's expected in terms of that. And just in general, the, the amount of um, Max for Live devices is quite a bit to maintain. And as I said, I don't personally use them. So if, if you're into Max for Live and, and like SP tools, get in touch. And then finally, some stuff that I'm gonna explain in a bit and for future things, there, I'm wanting to improve the core, like machine learning and offset detection and things like that. So uh, kind of data science, machine learning, uh, C++-y kind of brains. If you want to get in touch, get on the Discord or send me an email. It would be really cool to um, join up with more people and, and refine that stuff a little bit more. And if you've made it this far, I, you know, there, I figured it might be cool to talk about some of the stuff that what's in the pipeline, what things I'm working on, and what things are going to be improved because, you know, why not? You're here. Might as well tell you what's up. So one of the things that I've been working on behind the scenes is a new sensor. So um, I've had uh, yeah this going for a while. I'll just show you some of the, the pics here of the development. The idea being that I wanted to have an open source, easily makeable, 3D printable version of something like what the sensory percussion hardware is. So you have something that looks like this. So um, it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but the idea being that you can just print it with a hobby 3D printer at home without any weird parts. There's a couple funky bits, but the idea being that it's very easy to make for a hobby 3D person at home. So this has been going for a while. It's what I use actually, I've been using for all my stuff for the last, you know, seven, eight months since I've been doing it. 
Um, in general, it sounds a little bit better than the sensor percussion. There's, it's way less noisy. It's using a sci-fi new capsule. So it's a standalone individual active pickup with shielding, fairly flat response. So it's just a nice polyphonic guitar pickup and just so happens that it fits really nicely inside of a drum trigger. So that's one thing that's working. And I think for this upcoming version, there's been a, a hidden channel in the Discord, but I'm now gonna make that public. So if you're into 3D printing and all that kind of stuff, do get involved. My idea with that is to make it, um, have that come out with the one point of the release. So at the moment, I'm still tweaking the design a little bit just to make it a little bit easier to make and everything. But that's one of the things that's going with that. Along with that, I've been working with a couple big brain friends to do some triangulation stuff. So uh, because these sensors are a little bit um, easier to make and cheaper, you can have multiple of them. So having multiple on the same drum and depending on where you hit on the drum, you can use some math stuff to um, figure out exactly where you hit on the drum. So depending on the time delay of arrival at different sensors, you do some funny math and you can say, oh yeah, you hit the drum exactly right there. So that's something that's in the works. I'm working uh, with a friend of mine on the start of something, which is a percussive onset sound data set. So the idea it's going to be a large corpus of a bunch of drum hits on snare, toms, different sticks, different heads, um, coded, uncoded, mesh, etc. using the DIY sensor, sensor percussion hardware, DPAs, 57s. And the idea is over time to build up a really large library of this to use for machine learning, descriptor analysis, onset fingerprinting, all this kind of stuff. So that's something that's in the works. And if you want to get involved, let me know. Um, and then in terms of development for the code base for SP tools, <clears throat> I have wanting to add, uh, I think I'm going to be calling it segmentation. So at the moment in SP tools, you can do like a corpus based approach where there's a folder of individual samples, or you can do concatenation, which is a long single sample. What I want to do is add a mode where you can record a real time buffer. So one long sample, but then segment that sample into small chunks. So I'm, I'm at the moment, I think I'm going to call it segmentation or something like that. But the idea being to have a single long buffer, which you can be a single file or something you record in real time, like almost like a looper, and then be able to play bits of that on the go. So that's gonna require some restructuring, but that's something that's in the works. Uh, another thing that I've been wanting to add for a while, which is to interpolate between classes. So let's say I hit the center of the drum and the edge of the drum, have a continuous number between them. Um, that's a little less straightforward. I have something that works now, but the quality wasn't very good. So I'm still trying to refine that. Um, one of the things I actually wanted to add for the previous update and this one was regression where I have, let's say like a synth parameter or a set of parameters that sound really good. I can train that as a class and then another set of parameters and train it as a class. And then depending on the sound that you give it, it can morph between them. It's super easy to do in code, but interface wise is a little clunky, but that's something that's in the works to be able to, depending on the type of hit that you have, have that set a whole set of preset parameters for another process. I want to add some stuff with predictive and generative models where let's say I play a bunch of stuff and it gets the timing between them. And then based on that, have it predict what more future rhythms might be or descriptors. So that's something that's in the works. I want to add better ways to navigate so you can, you know, in Corpus Match and these, you can browse around with the mouse, but I want to make that uh, have larger libraries and be able to do that more quickly because the way that it works in Flucoma, it can slow down if you move very quickly. There's some stuff about transient replacement where when you have an onset, just replace the tiny start of the sound. I think that can sound quite cool. Going to be doing a bunch more stuff with the decomposition thing. I like this idea of audio processing where you can break sound apart in different ways. I don't think SP tools is really ever going to have stuff where there's like DSP as in like audio effects, but I do like the idea of having these decomposition things, which you can then do whatever you want with after that. And finally, one thing that I've wanted down the line is this idea of having a, a pseudo structural uh, scripting language. So similar to how you can use ramp and other sequencers, you have like these time based things that you can do. I want to have something where you can set up a simple scripting language where like, if the loudness is above this, or if there's been onsets more than 50, then do X, Y, Z. So set up a, a very low, uh, a very high level, low fuss uh, scripting language to be able to set structural things that you can then navigate on the fly. So that's something that I've, I've been wanting to work on for a while. But yeah, some of the stuff that's in the works and yeah, we made it this far, I figured might as well talk about that things. And as before, if you want to get involved, there's a discord, there's forum things, email me and that's what's coming up. Thank you.